It's the Juice Culture Leadership Podcast, where we come alongside and talk about all things leadership, life, ministry. It's called a leadership podcast, but we just talk about whatever we want to talk about. Is that the truth? Yeah. Are we talking about books today? No, no, we're not talking about books. Oh. But here's what we're talking about, guys. If um, we record these, they get released a little bit after we record them, but um, we were recorded with Phil Manginelli, and um, the Dodgers won. Yeah. Not in seven, like Phil said, though. They oh. won in five. Wow. And you wouldn't know this, but they dominated the Yankees. So uh, that's not news to anybody but you. Is that what you were hoping for? No, not even close. I oh. hate the Dodgers. Oh. <laughs> I don't like the Yankees either, though. So it's the first why time did, in my life that I've... Why would you... Uh, here's what maybe you could help me understand. How does one dislike a team? Oh. Is it because of an athlete? Is it because of a coach? No, this is the joy of sports, Becky. I feel like, like this podcast well, said, is turning I don't into like me mentoring Dodgers. you in sports. Yeah, you said, well, you're you the reason why you if you but love why a team, don't you like the if Dodgers? you love a team, you hate somebody. What? That's how, just why? how it works in sports. If I love the Giants, I hate the Dodgers. If I love the Kings, I hate the the Lakers. So because, because you the love Lakers the Giants? are our rivals, they're in our. Well, uh, the Lakers, the Laker fans would disagree that they're our rivals, but but they were, you know, they stopped us in 2002 or whatever from getting a championship, and their fans are yelling at our fans. They're so in our division. We're that. all competing for the same thing. But I don't understand. How could you not like a team from your state? That is what just because they're in our division. You just wouldn't understand this because they're in our division, <laughs> and they're stopping us from getting what we want, you, and they're cocky while they're doing it, Becky. Can they not do that? Can we just not? pit state against state like that just feels Becky wrong. I can't right now there's four <laughs> basketball teams in California there are yes. four so you would well, yes the Lakers and, and there's and the there's, Warriors yes and there's four baseball teams oh the Kings no 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 there's wait five. is that right there's five baseball teams You're in saying, California. No, no, the Kings are a basketball team. Listen, guys, I apo- listen for everybody What's listening to this right now who knows sports. I apologize. I I don't I'm know if I if I were you, this. I would never receive spiritually from Becky I, at all if she can't even describe why you don't like another sports team. I'm why you feedback. dislike? I don't just dislike. I hate. I am getting feedback on this that people are with me and they think that you're mean to me. People are soft. Okay, but wait, what's the fourth team? I'm really curious now. Of NBA teams? Yes. There's the Golden State Warriors, Sacramento yes. Kings. Yes. Yep. Los Angeles Clippers, Los Angeles oh, Lakers. The Clippers. Okay. Yes. yes there I've we heard go. of them. Baseball. Can you name the baseball team? San Diego Padres, uh, the Padres Los and the Angeles Giants. Angels, Los oh. Angeles Dodgers. <laughs> There's the Los Oakland Angeles Dodgers? Athletics. Okay. So what and is. And the San Francisco Giants. So what's the connection between the Los Angeles Dodgers and the other Dodgers? They're not. Well, the, the, there's not another Dodgers. There's Anaheim. The Los Angeles Dodgers is the oh, Dodgers. Oh, they're the ones who. I bet you I can't with you right now. Well, welcome to the Leadership Podcast, where we don't talk about leadership. We talk about random sports things while I'm trying to mentor Becky. I don't even know how to bring it to theater value for you. Uh, you, know, you know how there's one theater troupe and there's another theater troupe. I did not know the Dodgers troupe, who just won that, the World Series were from California. That's awesome. <laughs> that's not awesome. They're from Southern California. They're our arch nemesis rival. Uh, I can't with I'm you sorry. right now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. Well, welcome to the Leadership Podcast. Always great to have you with us. Becky, last night uh, we did a men's gathering. Phenomenal. Guys, I'm just there. telling you right now, wherever you are around the world, God's moving amongst men. We are seeing the statistics in America in particular about how women are the predominantly spiritual leaders. Uh, we're seeing men step up in a beautiful way. But one of the big differences I saw last night between the men's gathering and the women's gathering was um, my wife, who runs all the women's stuff here. CJ runs all that, you know, they have like really cute things they've set out and tables with flowers, charcuterie, how do you, what's that? Charcuterie, the centerpieces. Charcuterie boards, centerpieces. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful. And uh, our team put the tables, these plastic round tables last, last night and they wanted to put um, tablecloths on them. I'm like, black tablecloths. I'm like, we don't need those. We're fine. And they were like flabbergasted, mortified. Like like the, the women that are setting things up are mortified. They're like, they're, they're so beat up. I'm like, we don't, what do I care if there's a tablecloth on this table? We're sitting around a table. We're going to connect. What do we care? And uh, there was a big thing on it. And you know what? Uh, one, of the, one of our leaders actually texted afterwards and says, we didn't even need table decor. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was surprised. I peeked in. Last because night. I'm a big excellence guy. You are. And so Ex- I, I require excellence. I value yes, excellence. And, so, and it's and excellence is in the details. Yes. And it's one of our core values. We have 10 core values oh, at Jesus Culture. Oh, it's massive core value. And it's a huge core value. So when I walked into the men's event that you're coordinating, the first <laughs> table I saw had no tablecloth. And I There's legitimately- like red tape on the yes, side I of it. Yes, I legitimately been, I was like, oh my gosh, they put this up last minute. I need to go. F-. And then I looked beyond and I saw, oh, every table doesn't have a tablecloth. This is on purpose. Okay. It was fantastic. The spirit of God still moved. <laughs> it was fantastic. We didn't need it. It was a waste of time. 200 men? Come on. It was, it's it amazing. Was such Around a, tables, yeah, sharing life. Yeah, such a great night. It was really powerful. So, hey, one of the things, I, um, I, I, it's what I want to talk about on the podcast this week because I've been preaching this message recently. Um, I, for whatever reason, I did a message on Sunday here that was about worship, but it was about singing. And it was about why we sing to the Lord and like how much God loves our singing and how much he loves when we get together in the assembly and sing. So it's a pretty practical message. I spoke to our church and you get this when you travel and speak. There's certain words you're traveling with, yeah. certain things you feel like the Lord showed you, or certain things that you've developed that you travel with. But then there's a lot of stuff I'm just speaking on Sunday morning here to our congregation as we're kind of helping shape them. Uh, sometimes it's more practical. Sometimes it's just a little bit more, you know, kind of spiritual formation but I've been feeling this stirring in my heart around this thing to the Lord. It's very practical. Like I just kind of go, here's kind of what the Bible says and here's why it matters. And so I was just, I just preached this the other day. But one of the things, one of the reasons why I think it's been on my heart and one of the reasons why I think the Lord's asking me to, be, to speak this particular message is because part of the message I am talking about, we have a tendency to kind of make everything about us. Mm-hmm. And even when it comes to worship, the singing worship, even when it comes to that, we have a tendency to kind of make it about us. Yeah, We worship because we like it a lot, because God's presence is there, because we enjoy it, because whatever else. When in reality, worship has nothing to do with you. It it does because there's overflow and that's the odd part. But, but ultimately God says, hey, come before me with singing and bring songs of thanksgiving, bring songs of joy, bring songs of declaration of who I am. I love when you come and sing to me. The Bible's got you know 50 direct commands of singing, 400 wow. indirect references to singing. And I'm finding that when I'm speaking about this, even in our culture, so we have a very, what we would say is, and there's a lot of churches, you know, Jesus image and upper room and Bethel and that are very what we would call just presence-driven ministries. Mm-hmm. Like we value the presence above all else. That's, mm-hmm. what, that's what we desire. And so worship is a component of just that value for his presence. Mm-hmm. We've, we want to honor him and we value his presence. But I'm finding some of this younger generation coming up and our age, worship is still kind of about us. Yeah. It's still kind of like, so when you say, well, how is worship? How is worship on Sunday? I'm going to give you a description of my experience of worship Mm -hmm. when I should be saying, I don't know, you have to ask God. It was for him. Not one person in that room was singing to me. (laughs) Not one person in that room was singing to me. Yeah, We were all bringing a gift to God. I say all that to say, I actually think it's across the board for us that we have a tendency to make everything about us. Mm -hmm. That somehow we slowly but surely (laughs) make it about us. Yeah. And we can't set ourselves aside mm-hmm. for someone else, for something else, for something greater. And yeah. I think we're just running into it. Yeah. I was just listening. Re- I re-listened to Pete Hughes spoke at Pastors Conference Which, By the way, I love Pete. Pete, Pete, Pete I'm, sure gonna, he's, I'm sure he's listening. Yep. I think, oh, Pete's, a, Pete's an avid JCLP I listener. Think, Pete right now is taking notes. And we're a big part of his spiritual formation. In London. Pete is the pastor of uh, KXC, Kingdom Crossing Church mm-hmm. in central London. Phenomenal church, phenomenal ministry. Spoke at our pastor's conference, which, by the way, we are going to be back in the UK May? with our pastor's conference in May in London this time. And Pete Hughes will be one of the breakout speakers. Come on. Um, so so I was listening to, I was re-listening to it. I was there. It was a really good message and I've listened to it twice now. I, I re-listened to it with my husband a couple days ago and he was talking, he's basically giving the the overview, the, the history of secularism and how human secularism yes. has crept in. So Maybe he, he doesn't know that, that our <laughs> Phil Manginelli has a corner on that market. <laughs> And so he's talking about the the history of how did this creep in? And he, he goes all the way back to the Enlightenment and the Renaissance. And he talks, it's so brilliant. 
You should listen to it. I know. He's smarter than all of us. So he says, okay, so the storyline of the Bible, you know, it starts up with creation and then it goes down with the fall and then it goes back up into recreation that after the fall, God sent Jesus to recreate, make all things new again and to bring us back into right standing after the fall. And so it has this like this arc of a curve of a storyline. And he said, what happened was the Renaissance thinkers said, we love like culture, the, the enlightenment, the, the philosophers, they said, we love this storyline. This is so brilliant. We just don't like that Jesus is in the center of it. And so let's take out Jesus Amazing. and put the autonomous self in yes. the middle. And he basically says- We that, became the center. Yes. This is the birthplace of secularism, of where the autonomous, the human self- I'm at the center of the story. I'm at the center of the story. And then he just goes into how this has affected worship, yes. how this has affected spiritual formation, how this is affecting our church. And it was brilliant. I thought, oh my gosh. And, and then he said, what happened is the church, we haven't changed it. It's a broad statement, but the storyline that God created <laughs> that got perverted by culture- made its way back into the church with the self at the center rather than Jesus at the center. And he said, if the cross isn't at the center, th then it's not God's story, that it's not the kingdom story. And this is the, this is the nature of fallen humanity. I mean, the book of Romans is the message of uh, because of the fall, man traded worship of the one true God, the only one worthy. We traded that, we exchanged that for worship of creation. Yeah. And so we worship, in essence, ourselves. Yeah. So we exchange the worship of God with the worship of ourselves because of the fall, because of sin. And I think that that fallen nature that's constantly trying to sometimes pop back up in our life yes. is trying to make it about us. It's yeah. about you. It's about you. It's about you. It's about you. Yeah. It's funny. Even in marriages, you. Uh, how long have you been married now? 16 years. 16 years. And um, even in marriage... It's funny. My wife will come to me. I mean, I'm 27. I don't do this as much anymore. But man, I, I just edit it. What's funny is, is I don't do this anymore. I just edit that I want to do it, which is she'll come to me and say, hey, you know, you did that thing and it hurt my feelings. And, and, and I immediately want to go, well, you did that other thing and it hurt my feelings. <laughs> I'm like, what is it about us that immediately wants to go, oh, it, it's about you in this moment. Let me quickly turn this about me. hundred percent. Like even in our conversation, even, like, oh, this moment's about you. I'm going to make this moment about me. So true. Like we just, it's just in there. It is. Kids do it, you know, all this type of stuff. And, and I think that we have to go, oh no, this, 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 I'm not the center of the story. Self-care, there's, you know, the whole self-care oh movement, gosh. which is, it's, it's weird sometimes talking against something because I do think there are traces of truth and I think we overreact so much that the pendulum just swings so strong. So like, yes, yes I, I don't think you should go burn out. I don't think you should be working all these hours. I think you should take care of yourself. I think you should have hobbies and you should have boundaries. And yes. You should know the word no and you yes. should not feel guilty, you know. But man, the self-care thing turns into a moment where it's like I have the inability to set myself aside. Yeah. It's self-obsessed. It's really what it's yes. like, yeah. What is good in moderation, but it's an excess. And I think one of my mentors, the great Jeannie Mayo said, I don't think your generation's burning out. I think you're rusting out. Yeah. So the self-care thing or or this it just turns into this where you just read the Bible and the Bible's like, hey, here's an idea. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, <laughs> follow me, yeah. you know, lay down your life for others. Yes. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Esteem others higher than yourself. Yes. Like these are all what, what scripture talks about. And, and I, I, it's just fascinating to me how quickly we can turn it about us. Mm -hmm. And I would say as leaders, since we're talking on a leadership podcast, Leaders, so much of your life is to lay down for others. Yeah, leader, yeah. And you have to be able to set yourself aside. I'm not the center of the story and actually esteem others. But I, people do. What's interesting is, is people will naturally do this in other areas, like have children. Oh, 100%. Like talk about having to set yourself aside. Yeah. That little two-year-old's not like, Mom, have you had your self-care moment today? <laughs> You know, it can't, before I have a need, I want to make sure that you are, you know, filled up, whatever else. Yeah. And we know enough as parents to go, this is the greatest thing I'll do with my life. And yeah. so I get up early in the morning. I'm up late at night. Yeah. I take care of your needs before my needs. Mm -hmm. And we know how to set ourselves aside 
to lead. Listen, I'm talking to leaders right now to lead, yeah. to set that thing. And and I think that parenting is probably the maybe the best example of it. Yeah, marriage and parenting, hundred percent. Yeah, marriage you can still be the center and, and just kind of get mad at your spouse yeah. about it. It's yeah, hard to get mis- mad at miserable. that little little three month old yes, who's like, uh, sure. you know, how selfish can you be? Did it's you, so I true. was I need to go take a bath right now and <laughs> get some self care. And it's self care <laughs> Sunday. How dare you? It's self care Sunday. You're in it right now. I can self care a lot more because my kids are older. Yeah. So every Sunday after church, one of the absolute best moments of the week. I'm going to start another sports fight right now. One of the best moments of the week is after you, after Sunday morning, I have my routine. I go, I get some uh, cauliflower crust pizza at a certain place. I literally sit in my car with this cauliflower crust pizza, watching some TV on my iPhone, and then I drive home, and then I get all settled on the couch, and I turn on um, football, and I'm watching football. I might doze off in a nap. That's... It's just an unbelievable, great, wonderful moment that uh, you uh, can't experience at all. In fact, I feel anger over there right now. Is that what that is? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. I am so far from even that. The problem is that a, you're not, you're years I'm from years, that. I'm years, 15 years. Yeah, I don't know youngest, if you're 15 years. There's a point where you can three. T- I know, because you, in not too long, you tell your youngest to leave you alone. <laughs> like that is the, that is the great moment of freedom in a parent's life when you can say, <laughs> leave me alone. Oh, that's amazing. Come back in an hour. That's funny. Yes. So maybe one day. But you're not there right now. You're that's giving not me what hope. That's not what your Sunday afternoons look like? No, it's not at all. <laughs> no self-care going on. So- this word that you've been giving to churches and I just traveling think with it. The Bible's consistently saying, listen, have a sober mind, be alert. Just pay attention. Pay attention in your life. It, well, I would just say this. If you raise your hand to be a leader, welcome to laying your life down for others. 100%. So don't sign up to be a leader if you are not going to position your life to say, no, I, I am going to esteem others higher than myself. I'm not just going to take care of my needs. And I think as leaders, we also have to recognize Am I consistently making this about me? Is the storyline about me? You know, and I think it's a good heart check moment for anybody listening, because if we're honest, a lot of maybe many people get into leadership because they want it to be about them. Yes. Or they think that's, maybe that you've been modeled. Enneagram threes. You've been modeled that that's what leadership is. That's what you think leadership is. It's about you being the most important in the room. And it's, this is Maxwell's brilliant positional leadership, permissional leadership. He says the lowest, the lowest level of leadership is you have the title. Yes. That was just such an eye opener when I learned that. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, that's the like way to go. You You'd have fought the title. so long to get that title, <laughs> Becky. You'd worked so hard to get that title, and, he's and like, then welcome and to then, the uh, lowest Maxwell level. comes along and pop. Yeah, just welcome pops to the lowest balloon. level, and it's it's kingdom. You know, it's that we've talked about the what is it the sideways the sideways pyramid. It's not the yeah. the the triangle with the leader at the top. It's the one on the side where the leader going first, but and giving room for people to to excel to go further than you. Oh my gosh. True leadership, I think, honestly, is when you you genuinely desire that the people you're leading go further than you. Yes. And that's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> that's really hard to mean it. And I don't have a clear I, – I, I'm not going to get on here as a psychologist to give you a definition of narcissism, but we have been around what feels like narcissistic tendencies in people where they are always either the hero or the victim. Yeah. It's like every time I interact with you, you're either the hero in this story or you're the victim in this story, yeah. but it all centers back to you. Yeah. And uh, I think we're called to, uh, you know, we're called to get Oscars for best supporting actor, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and not everything we do, am I the hero or the victim? And just consistently guarding ourselves, checking our hearts around this thing and, just like, great guys, as crazy as is, my wife, who I love with everything in me, who I have committed my life to, who I am looking forward to getting old with, she'll come to me and I still want to make it about me. 100%. Like, this yeah. is the one person I'm very clear that I'm to lay my life down for her, right? Yeah. This is the one person that I'm very, it's not unclear to me what that I need to is- lay my life down and sacrifice and, uh, you know, and do what Jesus did for his bride. And I still want to make it about me in our interactions. Yeah. So I just think we have to, it, the minute we're aware of it, we can go, oh, no, mm-hmm. no, that thing, that's not, I'm not going to let that thing pop yeah. up. So making it about you, it's going to affect how you engage in worship. Yes. It's going to affect how you lead people. It's going to affect your ability to celebrate others, which we were talking about this in our staff meeting the other day, that, man, we're called to be people who celebrate others, who cheer them on. But you can't do that if you're 
consistently thinking about your need, your breakthrough, your desire, where am I? Yeah. And this is the stuff that really, I think that the birthplace of that envy and comparison, jealousy, bitterness, and all the stuff that produces strife in teams and in communities is really when, because when you're, when you are selfless, when you are not thinking about yourself and preferring others, no room for any of yeah. that. Yeah. Then so someone else gets a breakthrough, someone else gets a promotion, someone else gets noticed and you're just happy. You're yeah. happy that they are, you're happy for them. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Paul, I love pa- Paul's words when they they write to him. They're like, "Hey, people are preaching Christ, you know, with bad motive." Yeah, totally. Ooh, that's that's honestly probably transparently one of the hardest verses in the Bible for me because I'm a one, <laughs> and I am so it's obsessed wrong. with people's motives. It's right and wrong. And so when Paul goes. I like, I have read that. I have every translation, every commentary, like surely he doesn't actually mean, he's like, that's all right. As long as Christ is being preached. Oh, I, I don't, I, I struggle. I I'm like, so no, 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 it's not. It's about how, it's about how he's being yeah. preached or your motive. And Paul legitimately goes, no, it's not. Yeah. It's really not. It's incredible. <laughs> oh, so good. Well, listen, um, as we wrap up today, I want to tell you that I'm wearing right now, uh, you can't see it because uh, it's audio, but um, the JCSL, our Jesus Culture School of Leadership, um, which is really just another extension of our heart to help equip, encourage, strengthen, and connect leaders. And uh, it's completely online. Uh, the spring session opens up. They're taking applications for the spring session now. It's four months online, two mornings a week, and then a little bit more. And uh, it's it's incredible. We just want to raise up spiritually mature, relationally healthy, effective leaders. We've got three tracks you can jump into, the uh, marketplace track, the ministry track, and the worship track. And uh, just amazing what God's doing. We've got students from all over the world that join us. So if you're interested in growing more in your leadership, diving in with a community of leaders that are currently leading and wanting to go deeper, We'd love to have you check it out. So anyways, all right. Well, like us, star us, comment on us, all that type of stuff. I'm going to go watch some sports. 